There are a lot of concepts involved in nuclear physics, but if you're watching this for the MCAT, you're most likely to be tested on very foundational nuclear physics concepts. The first thing is to be aware of the different types of decay particles. And this is an area where physics and chemistry overlap because it's releasing chemical compounds such as a helium particle or, or alpha particle or various uh, electrons, etc. The decay particles are the alpha particle, which has a mass of four and a charge of positive two, and so it looks a lot like a helium nucleus. The beta particle is essentially an electron. It has no mass, but a negative charge. The positron is a zero positive one. It's a, the absence of an electron. And uh, gamma particles, which are not truly particles, are simply high frequency electromagnetic radiation. And because they're high frequency, that also means that they're high energy. And so that's a very important component of nuclear decay. When you're dealing with a nuclear decay type of formula, realize that these particles always end up on the right of the equation. These are the things that your initial atom will decay into. And that's why a positron can exist. There is no such thing as something with zero mass and a positive one charge. But if something gains uh, an electron, it looks a lot like it has lost a positively charged one due to the convention of always putting decay particles on the right. Now, how does this relate to physics? There are several different ways that it can. One is this famous equation E equals mc squared, where c is the speed of light and E is energy. When you have a nuclear decay that occurs, sometimes the sum of the masses of all the products will not equal the mass of the reactants on the other side. And that's what they call a mass defect. Some mass is lost in the process of this nuclear reaction. Whatever that mass defect is, when you multiply it by the speed of light squared, which is usually three times 10 to the eighth meters per second squared, that tells you how much energy can be released by destroying a small amount of matter. Similarly, if you are to make a certain amount of matter, then it requires a tremendous amount of energy, also according to this formula here. Another area that you can see nuclear physics show up on a lot of exams is that it can be treated as a collision. You can have a stationary nucleus that releases an alpha particle that travels very, very quickly. And because of that, it resembles a collision where uh, two pieces and one piece are coming together or going apart. In this case, it is separating, and that is an inelastic collision. But you can also see the potential for uh, momentum to be conserved and for kinetic energy to be conserved. And so these are very important areas where the physics of nuclear reactions can be very relevant. You can see the conservation of momentum you expect from a collision, and you can see the conservation of kinetic energy that you might expect from an elastic collision. Other things that you might be responsible for are calculating the decay rate, which is essentially the change in mass over the change in time, and that is because a core nucleus is releasing particles and degrading. And if you need to, the amount left after a certain period of time can be calculated using this formula. The final mass equals one half raised to the n times the initial mass. And that's how they do radiocarbon dating and a lot of nuclear type dating. And uh, the n here, be aware that that is the number of half-lives. Now, if you're working with only a few half-lives, sometimes it can be just easier to do simple calculations. The first half-life, you can say, okay, we started with this much mass, now we've cut that in half. After the second one, you've taken that number and cut that in half instead. So a lot of times, just counting half-lives on your fingers can be the most effective way rather than doing exponential equations, especially if calculators aren't available. But be aware of these four types of particles. You have to know all of these and realize that gamma is really a measurement of energy rather than a discrete particle that is being released. And recognize that this is one of the few places where energy and matter can interact directly. E equals mc squared allows you to destroy matter and produce energy or to use energy to produce matter. And so this is very, very important for any relativity-based questions. Two terms that you encounter a lot when dealing with nuclear reactions are fusion and fission, and they're fairly straightforward. Fission 
is when you break a nucleus into two or more nuclei. Fusion is as it sounds. It's the fusing of two nuclei into a larger nucleus. The interesting thing about fusion and fission is that both of them can generate energy. And the question is how big the reactant nucleus is. Both fusion and fission will yield energy if the size of your main nucleus gets closer to iron 56. So iron with a mass number of 56. So fusion of smaller nuclei and fission of larger nuclei can both produce energy. The energy that is produced is measured by calculating the mass defect, which again is the difference between the sum of all the masses of the products and the sum of the masses of the reactants. If you lose mass from reactants to products, that's a mass defect and that means that matter has gone toward producing energy. The reason iron 56 is relevant here is because that is the most stable nucleus. It's not an important thing that they're going to test on the MCAT, but just realize that as things approach iron with a mass number of 56, you are going to be producing energy, whether it's by fusion of small nuclei or fission of larger ones.